Well, welcome everyone. My name is Jack Fortin, and I'm the curator and facilitator for this Winter Centered Life series. A couple of little housekeeping procedures here, just to remind you of uh, some of the logistic details. Today's meeting will be recorded as it will be posted to the adult, I mean, to the Augsburg YouTube channel at a later date. Secondly, we do have a live captioner today, so please click the CC button at the bottom of your screen uh, to enable the transcript. <clears throat> and lastly, we will have time after we hear from our speakers for Q&A, um, but along the way, if you have questions, please enter them um, in the chat section um, of, the, of the Zoom uh, system. Um, and depending on the nature of the question, I might interrupt the speakers or we will wait to, uh, to the conclusion of their presentation. Now I'd like to introduce you again to our theme for this series and particularly to this, our speakers for today. The Winter 2022 Center in Life series theme is our her historical heritage interrogating our sagas as we seek to live faithfully in the time being. And just a reminder, this impetus came as we reflected on the current situation that we find ourselves in with such a prolonged crisis, pandemic crisis, and the other kinds of crises that the pandemic has helped uh, elevate to our awareness. And we're aware of how individuals communities and institutions today are tending to look for short-term, quote unquote, relevant fixes instead of looking at their roots for guidance. People are tending to make up their future based on the immediacy of the crisis. One of the people in our history, Dietrich Bonhoeffer reminds us during the time that he was uh, in prison in World War II, that part of the challenge of the church was the fact that they lost their historical roots and tried to be clever and relevant um, with the Nazi regime. And so instead of being clever, they became complicit with uh, Hitler's regime. And how important for Dietrich Bonhoeffer was that we establish an, a historical future a future based on the historical roots from which we've come. So we've, uh, in light of this tendency that um, we've decided to unveil the findings of this uh, fascinating multi-year research project that has been addressing Augsburg's historical heritage as a demonstration of how anchoring ourselves in our own personal and institutional heritage can hopefully rekindle for you your own core understandings and discover some pathways for your sustainable future. We all have a heritage to draw on if we choose. We have a family heritage. Many of us have institutional heritages as well as a faith heritage. We can gain inspiration and motivation to address our moorings as we delve into the heritage of Augsburg, an institution that has demonstrated renewed vitality over these several years. So without further ado, I want to get, again in, introduce to you our, our speakers who today are very good friends of mine, and it's always a privilege to, to be with them um, as they think through out loud for us um, this history and its implications. Um, the first is, is uh, Dr. David Teedy, who's also a member of the Augsburg Board of Regents and President Emeritus of Luther Seminary and helped found the Christensen Center for Vocation. And Dr. Paul Primenau, our current president of Augsburg University. So the theme for today is faith and freedom, Augsburg and the Lutheran Free Church. But before we get into this theme, I wanted to ask both David and and uh, Paul, kind of what what drew you to this uh, to this theme and to this work? 
just briefly, uh, just so people can hear a little bit about your own personal uh, interest um, in this work. I'll, uh, I'll jump in quickly. Um, so for me, uh, this uh, is something that I believe is part of the work of leadership uh, in institutions, in particular institutions with such rich histories as Augsburg has, um, you know, histories that are marked both by faith traditions, but also by academic traditions, by um, you know a variety of contexts around where they're located. And, and so as we launched this project just a year ago uh, with a group of faculty, staff, and students, it uh, gave us an opportunity to do a deep dive into that history and, the, and to find in it uh, various threads that I believe help us to make sense of our mission and identity in the 21st century. So it's, I, I believe it's certainly an example of what uh, Bonhoeffer was calling on the church to do uh, you know, during World War II. Uh, and it, I, I would argue that it's something that, uh, as you've said, Jack, that uh, each of us individually and uh, in institutionally, we ought to you know, make this a priority. In fact, I've, I've become sort of a champion, a cheerleader for other folks you know, thinking about this, these kind of questions. And, and, you know, the, and the key for me is that it's both about appreciative inquiry, um, uh, that is, you know, what do we find there that is actually still completely valuable for who we are, but it's also about uh, accountability for the places where perhaps we have not lived up to our highest values as an institution. So um, I think it's really in the, the kind of creative tension between those two different uh, you know, ways of inquiring and or what I call interrogating our saga that we find uh, you know, that uh, kind of meaning and purpose as we go forward. So that, that to me is it's part of my, my commitment as leader of Augsburg to take on this work. Well, thank you, Paul. And David, besides Paul, uh, calling upon you to be a part of this. There's more to it than that. <laughs> Tell us what your, uh, your personal interest in this. Well, I've been glad to be recruited to this and uh, take a look as we did last summer with the whole group that Paul has assembled at the history of the Free Church and how that related to this. It's pretty interesting. You know, there's Paul uh, Privenow, who is a Luther College graduate, David Teedy, who came from another place down in Northfield, and both of us have fallen in love with Augsburg and seen it flourishing as really essential to the public witness of the institution, the tradition. I came across the river to Augsburg in 2005 and then have been on the board the last 12 years with uh, President Privenow. Uh, it's just amazing to see how his sense of vocation and vocation works together, that critical appreciation of the past, both critical and appreciative, that's a very complex art because now we all have to somehow interrogate our past to see the things that also blinded us to the changes that need to happen. These were little ethnic institutions and all of a sudden we are now involved in this much more complex world. Do we bring strengths from that past or are those all just blind spots that we have to deal with? So I want to just to cheer on that uh, what President Privenow has done with this project. This is a project that has been funded by a grant and is leading, I think, the network of colleges that are interested in trying to understand what their own legacies may bring, bring to their futures. Um, but I don't think anyone has done as well at this as Paul and mastering this with the engagement with faculty, staff, and even a, a board member or two. So I'm very hopeful that the whole institution will learn, and those of you who are participating today, and, and uh, especially the first session that uh, President Privetal led, are getting, being given a glimpse into a critical appreciative grasp of where that history uh, is going to take us. So to your other question, Jack, uh, all of you have a chance today, how does that apply to the way I appreciate and critically interrogate my own past? <laughs> Yeah. And all of us, in fact, have things of a past that we were complicit in systems we didn't even know were there. And suddenly we have to understand them. And then do we bring from our past things that help us deal with this future productively and hopefully? Yeah. So, three cheers for what President Privenow has got going here. Oh, thank you so much, David. Um, and so this session will return Augsburg's founding in 1869 and will retrace the influence of the Haugian tradition on the formation of the Lutheran Free Church and ultimately of Augsburg. So with that, Paul, I think you're going to lead off. So appreciate so much your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Jack. And it's uh, again, it's great to be with all of you. Maybe let me... Uh, 
just recap uh, the first two uh, sessions. I, I, many of you probably were there for those two sessions, but as uh, as uh, David noted in the first session back a couple of weeks ago, I introduced the idea of saga, which is really the fundamental concept that we've been using in this. And a, a saga is, um, uh, as defined by a, a man named Dr. Burton Clark, uh, it's a it's a um, a way in which we bind a community together. So for me, this historical work is in fact uh, aimed at how we are actually making sense of ourselves uh, in the 20th. 21st century uh, here in 2022 is in a very different context, very different uh, student body, very different, uh, uh, you know, set of challenges. And so, so that was where I introduced it. And specifically, I focus, focus there on uh, Augsburg's, uh, uh, you know, commitment to the, to its place and what it meant to be a part of a particular place in a neighborhood and uh, really the implications of that for both how we teach and what we teach, but also how we are engaged with our neighbors. And then last week, for those of you who are there, was a great opportunity to hear from Dr. Terrence Kwame Ross, the, from our education department together with uh, uh, Katie Bishop, who is our assistant provost for student success, who, who are part of, the, part of the saga group. And each of them took on a project which had to do with looking at uh, what it means to be the first to do something at Augsburg, you know, to be the first African-American student, to be the first woman. Um, and in particular, Katie focused on this kind of remarkable legacy of Dr. Gerda Mortensen, uh, the first dean of women at Augsburg in, uh, starting in 1921-22, and the ways in which she shaped this institution over um, you know, almost 50 years uh, and the impact that she had um, in the ways that she welcomed uh, women uh, to Augsburg uh, in the 1920s. And, and her legacy, of course, lives on. Her name is on a building, and uh, we, we honor that legacy. So today, we turn to perhaps the question that I'm asked more, most often um, about Augsburg. That is, how do you, in fact, still honor uh, the Lutheran Christian faith tradition? Uh, even though it's in our mission uh, that we are guided by the faith and values of the Lutheran Church. Uh, so we, we lift that up as a central part of our mission. But at the same time, to think about what that actually means um, and to go back into this history, this uh, really uh, distinctive history around Augsburg really founding its own denomination of the Lutheran Church, um, and to understand what was in that move uh, in the 1890s and uh, onward for 70-some years that, uh, that actually is still a part of how we think about our relationship uh, to our faith tradition. So let me start by... Um, by talking a little bit about, as uh, Jack mentioned, this um, notion of um, of the Haugian tradition, um, and oh, sorry, I jumped up here. So um, I, I'm sure there are many people on this call who know this story, but uh, this uh, lay preacher Hans Nielsen Hauge, uh, who lived in the late 18th, early 19th century in Norway, um, uh, had his own kind of spiritual baptism in the late uh, 1790s, and um, and this wonderful story that I've actually just learned by coming to Augsburg and really delving into this about how he was both somebody who cared deeply about preaching the gospel, but at the same time was in fact this very skilled old entrepreneur, a business person who helped to found businesses, who went into communities and uh, helped to help to make them stronger economically. Um, so here we have somebody who also uh, was able to, again, preach a living faith. That is, how is our faith lived out? But honoring Martin Luther's commitment to the fact that we are all called uh, by God into the specific stations that we have in life. So if you're running the local mill or you're the local cobbler or you're the local teacher, uh, those are callings that, in fact, are a part of your faith uh, in the world. And so, uh, as often happens with people who are prophets in their own time, uh, he was jailed for his efforts. Um, but interestingly enough, they would occasionally release him because they had a need for him to go back and help uh, particular communities to build businesses. And so, um, as many of you might know, um, after he died, he uh, many of his followers uh, continued to really challenge the Norwegian state church. Um, and ultimately, that led to um, those Haugians were some of those early pioneers who came to the United States seeking a better life to get away from the persecution by the government. And in fact, we're the founders uh, in 1869 of Augsburg Seminary, which was founded in Marshall, Wisconsin, and then uh, was brought, of course, to Augsburg uh, or to Minneapolis in 1872. Uh, so here, 150 years ago, when we came to exactly the block on which we're still located. Um, and this uh, this theme uh, and this important uh, work of Hauge really does set the stage because it, it, it carries with it a really an expansive understanding of what it means to be faithful in the world and and what the faithful are called to do it doesn't put it all in the hands of a of a you know, learned clergy as, as much as we care about a learned clergy it also just really lifts up uh, the role that all of us play in living out our faith and i would say that you know 100 and um, you know almost 200 years uh, later from uh, or more than 200 years later from when huggy himself was alive 
you know, we are actually honoring that as we teach students to become business people, to become teachers, to become social workers, nurses, and to see in that, in fact, a commitment to uh, vocational discernment that is, in fact, part of uh, a faith journey in the world. So, so it's the Haugen tradition that then really sets sets the stage, uh, if you will, for what happens um, uh, next. And um, you have, uh, I'm, my screen is jumping around here a little bit, I'm sorry. Um, uh, you have this historical arc itself of the Lutheran Free Church. And so, as I mentioned, Augsburg Seminary founded in 1869 in Marshall. Uh, uh, there are all kinds of claims that it happened in an attic, uh, you know, uh, who knows, but uh, one faculty member, a few students. Um, then the Trinity Lutheran Congregation, which we'll come back to in a minute, which brought, uh, invited the, the Augsburg Seminary to come to Minneapolis in 1872. Uh, and then we have um, these quarrels that started to happen almost immediately upon uh, these Norwegian immigrants being uh, in the United States that um, really led to a split uh, where there was uh, concern about, you know, who would be the college of the Norwegian uh, Lutheran Church, uh, what would be the seminary, and, uh, and of course, uh, that led to some uh, conflict between St. Olaf uh, and uh, Augsburg, which ultimately led the Augsburg contingent to form in 1897 the Lutheran Free Church. Um, and along the way, then, Augsburg shifted. As I mentioned earlier, we became co-educational in 1921. Um, the seminary and college, formally separated in 1942, um, continued to exist on the same campus, but were separate entities. Um, and then in 1963, the Lutheran Free Church uh, merges with the American Lutheran Church. And as you know, Augsburg Seminary then merges with Luther Seminary. Um, and if you go to Luther Seminary, it's fascinating. You can actually go up into the archives and still see how, in fact, uh, we now share a founding date of 1869 with Luther Seminary because when we merged, we took on the earliest date, which was the 1869. And there's a wonderful kind of uh, uh, mural on the wall that actually recounts the, that the history of the various threads of the Lutheran Church that came together at Luther Seminary. So uh, important to understand that arc of this particular tradition. Um, that is actually the uh, Trinity Lutheran Congregation building um, that's located. That's the picture that's on the screen, and that. Um, that uh, church building, of course, was located on what is now uh, Interstate 94. Um, so it was torn down when the interstate was built. Uh, and then Trinity Lutheran Congregation, um, as David will talk about in a few minutes, actually um, uh, was sort of nomadic for a while, uh, was in various uh, kind of buildings, and ultimately now uh, is, is actually uh, worshiping uh, in Augsburg's chapel. So there's a wonderful symmetry to uh, to how uh, the, the, organiz the institution, the congregation that that brought Augsburg to Minneapolis is now firmly embedded as part of uh, the Augsburg campus. And we're very proud of that and are very pleased to be their partners uh, in the good work that they do um, in our neighborhood. So uh, just a couple quick uh, pictures that um, I've put together here that I'll just uh, remind folks of some of these historic dates that kind of link. So in 1814, the Norway had its own constitutional assembly and, and there were some actually prominent names, including uh, the Sverdrup uh, kind of lineage that actually was uh, part of that effort to uh, a new constitution for Norway. Um, and uh, we're very proud of that Sverdrup tradition, which of course continued with the first, the, uh, um, the second and third presidents of Augsburg, or second and fourth presidents of Augsburg, I should say, father and son, Georg and George Sverdrup, um, and the Sverdrup name lives on, you know, on our campus. Um, we also have um, uh, this kind of important, uh, you understand that a lot of things were still in Norwegian up to, um, up until, uh, you know, the uh, 1930s, at some point they started to uh, put things into English, but it was uh, interesting. I have the 50th anniversary history of Augsburg, and it was in fact um, written uh, in completely in Norwegian. So so, um, so we now have the 50th, the 100th, and the 150th histories of Augsburg that really tell a remarkable story of our commitment to, uh, to in fact, this faith, this Lutheran free tradition and the way that the Lutheran free church um, really shaped who, who Augsburg is today. So I'm going to pass this uh, now over to, uh, to David to talk a little bit about what, in fact, what are some of the marks of the Lutheran free church that are still, uh, we think, very relevant to who we are today. So um, I will... Uh, attempt to make this screen. Um, there we go. David? Well, it's very intriguing to think about all the immigrant groups that came from Northern Europe for the Lutheran tradition and all leaving what were state churches, and then how would they be the church in North America? Uh, Augsburg was very adamant about breaking away from the uh, structure and the frames of the authority systems of the state church 
And so this whole focus on fervent personal spiritual experience, which sometimes people uh, disregard as personal pietism or something, it was that, but it was much more than that. It was a, a sense of the living faith, the talk speak of the, the worship of the living God, uh, and a strong sense of the, the congregation in worship as the center of the church. This is the church in this place. And uh, so that sense of congregational, sometimes autonomy, but mostly Christian identity, and therefore you also acquired your vocation from your community. That place was what shaped you, and um, very deep sense that every member who was baptized was commissioned to be uh, a representative of the gospel of Jesus Christ in their life, no matter where they were. And that also led away from the elite vision of education uh, that happened to, even to this day in uh, European theological schools, there is a kind of a division between the fairly elite, highly intellectual university-based education, say at the University of Berlin, that was true of Northern Germany and of Sweden, and in Norway, uh, Hauge and that tradition had a spectacular impact upon the equipping of pastors to lead congregations in a sense of mission and global mission. And uh, coming with that, was this highly, very naturally, democratic convictions and the growth of schools and hospitals and mission programs in which uh, all the people of God had a significant role. You can see how this requires a place like Augsburg. Next slide, please. So that congregational uh, understanding can end up in a mere congregationalism as if there's nothing else, and that isn't really characteristic, but it's part of the tension in this tradition. And when we speak about theological freedom, this is a very fascinating thing because you'll see when we start talking about some of the names of the intellectual leaders of this tradition, they were wide open to discussion what was happening in the European world and the North American world, very quickly anti-slavery, very quickly involved in all kinds of dimensions where the uh, more structured, formalized churches that were still thought of themselves as European were much more sluggish and this lived experience, which we're speaking, uh, was just a lively thing. There was a there are famous stories about the Norwegian churches in Brooklyn that uh, that were a kind of a spiritual renewal presence, and the Siemens Mission in Boston, all kinds of places where this tradition had taken deep root. And the role of the laity or the people of God is very essential. They were not anti-clergy but they were not going to be run by some uh, priestly system, that's for sure. And that ecumenical openness is very interesting, because this was a different ecumenism from the European sense, which was really kind of a, a detente question of state churches talking to each other. The, this group of uh, Scandinavians didn't really interested in that, but they were very interested in forming common bonds with other Christians who are interested in engaging the world and, um, and communicating the faith publicly. So that sense, as you can hear it again, leads to a very deep need for a college that will be alive to its social and politically equipping the next generation of leaders. Okay, next slide, please. Maybe just a quick word here, David, because I think that one of the things that's been striking to me is to look um, back at this history and to understand you know, Augsburg Seminary's role, even in the uh, 1880s and 1890s, supporting uh, public education in Minneapolis, and then to jump forward to the role. I know you're going to talk a bit about uh, Bernard Christensen, but his role on Hubert Humphrey's um, uh, Human Rights or Civil Rights Commission. And just uh, so I think we go back to this notion that uh, to be faithful also is, in fact, to be relevant to exactly the kind of social and political issues that are in front of communities as they uh, as they mature. So I think a really concrete example of exactly how that played itself out uh, in uh, in real time. I'm very interested and wish we had time to talk about at uh, what point in 1942 they decided to divide the seminary from the, the college. Uh, but at that time, the college was gaining its own kind of strength, and it wasn't just going to be run by the theological faculty either. Fascinating business. Well, uh, my own personal reckoning, I mentioned about falling in love with Augsburg and the Free Church, this actually began when I was a seminarian at uh, Luther Seminary. Paul Sana came over in my first year of student. I transferred in from Princeton Seminary, and Paul Sana came and gave the American Church History Lectures. Wow! 
could that guy lecture? If some of you will remember hearing Paul Sonic lecture, it was just thunderous. And uh, every lecture was honed and shaped and very passionate. And then Philip Kwanbeck was doing wonderful work in New Testament studies at Augsburg already. And then you go back to Bernard Christensen in that list. Um, it's so interesting. Christensen had gone off and done work in Europe. And part of what happened for Christensen's own education is that he got introduced to historical critical studies of the biblical work. And there was very much nervousness about that in immigrant Lutheranism in this country. And in fact, he had to write a, uh, a statement about why this work was appropriate for Augsburg to pursue before he could be accepted as its president. It's a fascinating document to see how he did this. So Augsburg moved into historical critical studies well ahead of Luther Seminary, and I think of several of the other seminaries too, because of the intellectual clarity and freedom that Bernard Christensen brought to it. I mean, la last week also, the wonderful conversation about Gerda Mortensen. Uh, we could add the work of, uh, of Joel Torstenson and of uh, John Stensvog. He was a president of the Free Church and a professor of Old Testament at Augsburg, and then came over to Luther Seminary when uh, the merger happened in 63. Um, John Sinslog had a huge impact upon my understanding of the scriptures of Israel and their prophetic force as being a living tradition. So there was no escaping uh, a kind of a, and were no a way to hide in a kind of a trivial pietism because the God of the prophets was the God that uh, uh, John Sinslog brought to us. Uh, when I came back from my doctoral studies uh, and I had been teaching in Claremont, California, I came to Luther Seminary and I needed to have pastoral experience in order to be eligible for uh, tenure at Luther Seminary. And they arranged a call for me to join Sheldon Torgerson and Dick Mark at Trinity. By this time, Trinity was worshiping at Our Lady of Perpetual Help, which was pretty funny because all these Norwegian pietists were in the midst of this uh, uh, Bohemian Catholic Church with uh, Stations of the Cross that you couldn't just didn't quit. But that was kind of the characteristic. We're free. We can do what we need to do here. And the Catholics and the Lutherans got along just great. Uh, and it was a very interesting, wonderful learning experience for me. And at that point, I got to meet Bernard Christensen. And uh, he was uh, very crippled up with severe arthritis. But he came over to Luther Seminary as a faculty member then, and I remember sitting and being interviewed by Bernard Christensen, that's the only adequate word, and he just had one question after the other after the other, and then I began to get a glimpse of the spectrum of thought and conviction that had brought uh, such a wonderful spirit from Augsburg and to Augsburg. Okay, the next slide, please. Um, so then I came over to... Augsburg in the year 2005 as uh, the first uh, occupant of the Bernard Christensen chair. We had to invent it. We didn't know what it was supposed to be, but we did spend a lot of time with other key faculty leaders. Mark Trendick had a big role in this. Philip Conbrecht II had a big role in this uh, to try to help us understand what was it that we have learned at Augsburg from Bernard Christensen that deserved to be perpetuated. Now, this was kind of our version of a legacy or a, a uh, saga investigation from about 2005 to 2010, crafting these lessons. And I remember meeting with uh, Bernard's widow, Gracia, who was very frail at that time. She said, you can only come for a brief time because I get so weary. I said, I'll be out in 20 minutes. Well, two and a half hours later, she let me go because she had so much she wanted to tell me. And these five lessons are the, been crafted and pounded and argued over by faculty and finally even the full board reviewed them. And you can hear in that the first one, that whole sense of freedom. Christian faith liberates minds and lives. There's a real conviction that this is not to shut down thinking, but it is to open it up. And that second one, diversity strengthens vital communities. We have no idea at that stage, but a little few clues of what was coming for Augsburg, and now Augsburg's investigation and investment in diversity as not to dissipate itself, but to become a character, a particular kind of community, is just, that's the script. And as interfaith friendships and rich learning, that was a real, we spent a lot of time on that one, and you can see now 
as we work with a strong work on uh, the Christensen Center and the now a new chair that's coming in interfaith studies. Uh, this is our task. And then the next one was sort of Bernard Christensen's mysticism, the love of Christ draws us to God. And that was both our love for Christ and our sense that the, the Christ love is a force that works in our lives, all of which leads to our calling to service in the world. Um, these lessons, I've been very grateful to see how under Paul's leadership have been sustained in the, even in the strategic plans and discussions um, as a way to make sure that our grounding, in fact, empowers the change into which we're living, but it doesn't dissipate what we've been about. Okay. I just say a quick word here. So there's a picture here of Bernard Christensen um, standing in front of what was then the new science building. And of course, uh, folks on this call know that we now have the Hegford Center for Science, Business, and Religion. And uh, but Dr. Christensen, as you know, uh, the sixth president of Augsburg, I'm the 10th, um, you know, really did, uh, through David's uh, remarkable work as the inaugural Christensen Professor, really set in motion over these past 20 years now, a way that we've um, really drawn on this legacy in very concrete ways. And uh, and as many of you know, of uh, Marty Stortz, Martha Stortz uh, succeeded David as the uh, second Christensen um, professor, and now we are about uh, uh, about a month away from appointing the next Christensen professor. So that legacy is now embedded. Uh, there's actually an endowed professorship that uh, David mentioned, um, and then also we have uh, created something called the Christensen Center for Religion or for Vocation, rather, um, which um, uh, I know that many of you uh, heard from uh, Jeremy Myers and Christina Fouget in the fall about the remarkable work of the Christensen Center and its Riverside Innovation Hub and the ways. They're really uh, leading that work, uh, you know, in uh, in congregations uh, across the, the Twin Cities area. So very, very proud of that uh, of that legacy. So let me um, pivot from David's really helpful way of kind of describing uh, the kind of marks, if you will, of this Lutheran Christian tradition that we inherit um, to think about how we understand this faith and theological tradition today. And this is really goes back to the point of both appreciation. But also criticism. I mean, if uh, as we talked about in the first session a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, the folks for the Lutheran Free Church, they were um, not always sure that the city was where they wanted to be. Um, and they based uh, some of their decisions about potentially moving the campus away uh, because of their fear of the city. And so some ways weren't uh, willing or able at that point to lean in to what the challenges of that time really meant for, the, and, you know, and I've, I've got to diminish anyway the fear or whatever was going on there, but but to think a little bit about those places along the way where where what we're claiming here about this uh, tradition, in fact, uh, hasn't always uh, you know come to fruition in the way that we might like. And so it's really it's important for us to see this again, both as appreciation and criticism. But what I, want wanna, to I want to yeah. interrupt there just for a second, that whole prospect that Augsburg would be moved uh, to South Minneapolis, uh, was Richfield, I guess it was, was very much alive and some people invested deeply in it, bought property to move and so forth, and, but Bernard was not open to it. We needed to stay there. What's interesting is that Trinity faced the same problem when the freeway came through and a lot of people at Trinity said, let's move. And uh, others said, no, we were called to this place. We, in fact, brought Augsburg to this place. God has a calling for us here, and it does for Augsburg, too. So it's fascinating to say there was a sense of the sanctity of a location, which was not a very impressive-looking place at that time. And uh, But there was a deep spirit of conviction there. Wonderful. So let me um, pivot then again from uh, what this legacy um, has come to uh, mean for us um, to how we think about translating it into what we are today. And um, we have uh, been just uh, gifted with the work of uh, Professor J Daryl Jodock. Many of you might know Daryl's work, a uh, uh, longtime professor at Gustavus Adolphus uh, College. Before that was actually at Muhlenberg College, did a stint for a couple of years at his alma mater, St. Olaf, and helping those institutions to think through their Lutheran heritage and what it means. But Daryl has done a real service to our work as Lutheran colleges and Lutheran higher education by, by offering us a, a metaphor uh, of a bridge as a way of understanding uh, what he calls a third way of being a college or a university in the 21st century. And he 
creates this distinction between uh, totally sectarian places, that is, uh, places where uh, the faith tradition is just, uh, you know, up front every day. And in fact, people have to sign faith oaths and things. You think about places like Bethel here in the Twin Cities or Wheaton in Chicago or uh, other places like that. Uh, he juxtaposes that notion against those that are totally non-sectarian, so the public universities and others that, in fact, uh, you know, can't even address faith questions. It's just not something that they really can even touch. Um, and he describes our Lutheran college, at least our ELCA Lutheran colleges, as, in fact, a third way of understanding um, the role of faith in shaping the work of a university. And by using this bridge of metaphor, he, he reminds us that uh, a bridge, and um, uh, just for the sake of uh, giving you a visual here, I have a, here a picture of a bridge. <laughs> and, um, and what he talks about here is that a bridge has at least three different components. It has footings, which are those that are actually below the surface. Um, and they are, in fact, he would argue in our colleges, the footings are the theological principles that, in fact, have informed who we are today. And so uh, the kinds of things that David lifted up uh, coming out of the Lutheran free tradition, the, the Bernard Christensen legacy, uh, those, in fact, those lessons are all footings, if you will, that are uh, very much uh, go deep into our, our mission and identity as an institution. But then bridges also have pillars. And so you see here pillars in this picture that take you up. And the pillars are the means by which those theological pr principles are translated into policies and practices that, in fact, really inform day-to-day -day life uh, at the university. And then he talks about the bridge, the platform, basically the, the bridge on which uh, you know traffic would travel as the place where day-to-day -day life happens uh, at a university. So in the classroom, uh, in the residence halls, on the athletic fields. And his point is that the people up there on the bridge uh, at any given moment may not really fully understand how, in fact, the footings and even the pillars uh, really are important to their life. But by understanding the whole here as the as this bridge metaphor, we are able to make the argument that, in fact, we are, uh, the kinds of work we're doing today up on the platform of that bridge are, in fact, fully uh, informed by, in fact, those footings and their translation through the pillars. And so this has become um, really an important component of the work of the 26 colleges and universities of the ELCA in trying to understand, uh, each in our own way, how a particular uh, understanding of the Lutheran faith tradition has in fact, and continues to inform day-to-day -day life uh, at places like Augsburg. And so with this bridge metaphor uh, in mind then, um, you know, one of the things that we've done is to begin to think about specifically, how does this take shape in the day-to-day -day life at Augsburg? So what are the, the gifts or the charisms of Lutheran higher education that in fact, um, you know, really are present uh, for students in just the ways in fact, life is led on our campus every day. And I've actually crafted this in terms of what I call five charisms of Lutheran higher education. You'll recognize them. They go right back to the, to the Christensen lessons. Uh, but in particular, to use this phrase from Martin Luther um, that I first learned from my friends up at Concordia Moorhead, that Luther called it on an, an education fit for everything. And I just love that phrase, an education fit for everything, uh, a way of thinking about how education infuses itself into everything we do, not only at the university, but actually in, in our lives, our personal lives, this, this notion that we're asked all always to, you know, to ask the question, what does this mean? And then meant that way becomes sort of a mantra for our lives of faith in the world. So uh, just to, to go through quickly these five lessons, um, first of all, the concept of vocation and a meaningful life, which uh, certainly is central and has become a critical part of Augsburg curriculum. All of our students take uh, two courses uh, in uh, in the concept of vocation and try to understand no matter what their own faith tradition is. Um, second, uh, critical, humble inquiry, uh, this notion that, um, that only God uh, knows the truth um, and that, in fact, we are constantly in search of the truth among competing ideologies. And so we bring a certain humility to that work, um, which is certainly uh, in line with our, our academic mission, uh, how we engage the other and learn from the other. So back to the notion that interfaith friendships, for example, um, are part of our teaching and learning. Um, how we serve neighbors and seek justice and thus have the possibility of creating healthy communities. And then finally, the concept of semper reformanda, um, this notion, again, that nothing that humans create is permanent, um, but we have to constantly be thinking about how we are, in fact, responding um, through the lens of our own commitments, our own uh, tradition, uh, to be able to be a sustainable institution. So let me say a quick word about each of these, um, just to kind of give you an example of what difference they make uh, for Augsburg. So at Augsburg, um, and here's a set of pictures of our students uh, you know, doing what they do. So we have students at a computer, we have students uh, 
uh, wrestling, you know, we're big in wrestling. Um, for those of you who don't know that, that you may know that the two top wrestling uh, programs in the country at uh, the Division three level are Augsburg and Wartburg. So uh, it's an important part of our life. Uh, we have students in a laboratory. We have students uh, in a music group. We have uh, students graduating and shaking the hands of a board chair. And then we have students who come to our house, actually, to be honored for their various achievements. So seeing every student as gifted and called becomes an incredible kind of frame, if you will, for the ways we think about meeting them where they are as students and helping them to be successful. You know, and when you think about that in the ways that for most of you, I think you understand, we have become um, at this point, actually a majority minority, a majority BIPOC, a black indigenous people of color institution, uh, where over the last three or four years, about 60 to 65 percent of our entering class are students from communities of color. And so this is a complete transformation of Augsburg's student body, but it doesn't change our commitment. We still see each of those students, no matter their lived experience, their particular faith tradition, their particular cultural uh, heritage, they still come to us as gifted and called. And we engage them with that lens so that the education they receive, the experiences they have at Augsburg are all about helping them to discern the call that they will have in their life. And, and I will tell you that um, I have had uh, students, for example, of the Muslim faith come up to me uh, near their graduation and tell me when I learned the concept of vocation from that required religion class that I really didn't want to take but when I learned that concept, it has helped me to make sense of the decisions I'm making about my career, about my, my own faith tradition, about my life in the community. And so in many ways, I see that as actually a gift of um, our tradition that we're giving to uh, our students at this point. And, uh, and that is such a critical part of what I would all call a form of evangelism, even, um, if you will, uh, that we're about uh, in terms of understanding who our students are. Um, as David mentioned also here, we do have the Bernard Christensen Center for Vocation, which takes this concept of vocation and actually infuses it across, not only in the curriculum, but through special programs that we have. And I've mentioned the fact that we have a faculty position that really uh, helps to be a thought leader and a, a on-campus leader in that work. Uh, many of you know uh, Bishop Hansen, uh, Mark Hansen, an Augsburg grad came to Augsburg after his retirement as the presiding bishop and has been a part of our community over the past uh, uh, eight or nine years and, and provided so much leadership in this work. Um, the second then is critical humble inquiry. And again, this kind of goes to our academic uh, mission, if you will, uh, especially our commitment to the liberal arts. So in many ways, I would say that the Hague first Center for Science, Business, and Religion, which opened uh, you know, just four years ago, um, uh, is actually an illustration of that. We believe that bringing together science, business, and religion into one building um, is actually creating an opportunity for students to learn across disciplines, to ask questions of the world. So if you're a business student, uh, you are located uh, just uh, down the hall from our psychology department, and down below is our religion department, and how it, just in the, just the optics of that kind of combination of disciplines in the one building give us a chance to really um, challenge our students to think about you know asking questions of, of what's going on in the world and what their response to that is going to be and so this building becomes a, a symbol of that commitment if you will uh, to critical and humble inquiry um, it's also helping us uh, to break down some of the notions of how you teach um, I talked about this I think a couple weeks ago but we have this thing called the river semester now where students go out uh, on the river and spend an entire semester and think about that we're breaking down the kind of normal ways that you teach. Um, uh, these students take a full course load for an entire semester on the Mississippi River. Think about that. I mean, um, you may say that you wish you had had the chance to do that. I'd met these students back at the end of the fall semester, and they had slept on the ground for 100 straight nights. So I'm not sure any of us really wanted to do that. But they, they will come back and tell the story of how this experience of teaching and learning, getting a full college curriculum for a semester, actually has, has led them to ask different kinds of questions and to bring that kind of critical and humble um, perspective to their inquiry and to their learning. The third charism then is how we do engage the other. Um, and uh, we've mentioned a couple things. This certainly is uh, an area where Augsburg, because of the diversity of our student body, has become really a centerpiece of, uh, of the interfaith movement in colleges and universities across the country. We're um, often recognized as one of the leading places in the country for this work. And it's led to the creation of uh, curricular programs, uh, uh, co-curricular programs, uh, public presentations. We even got a New York Times article back several years ago when we hired a Muslim a chaplain to join our campus ministry staff, an important part of our commitment to our Muslim students alongside of our two Lutheran that we have, uh, but thinking about how we 
how we really honor that faith journey that all of our students are on and understand how faith, learning, and service go together. Uh, and so uh, certainly interfaith is one place where that work plays itself out. Um, serving our neighbors and seeking... I want to step in quickly on the interfaith. I Just for people to understand, this is not the same thing as comparative religions, which happens in lots of academic contexts. And there's just kind of the phenomenology of different belief systems and whatever. This interfaith is highly relational and deeply grounded. So it does call forth what is the faith that a Muslim student brings. And they need to have that so that their friendship between Christians and Muslims or Jews or Sikh or whoever they are, uh, people have to be able to learn to speak from their faith. Uh, where else in the world can this happen? It's quite remarkable. Yeah. And as uh, David mentioned earlier, we have um, a wonderful gift that has uh, established a new endowed professorship um, uh, in interfaith studies, and we are uh, about to fill that position. Um, so uh, also now embedding it very much in our curriculum, um, and uh, and so we're very proud of that work. So uh, serving the neighbor, as you uh, folks on this call probably know, um, you know, in Martin Luther's voluminous writings, neighbor was probably the word he used more often uh, than almost any other word. And so clearly it was central to his understanding of what it means to live our faith in the world. And for Augsburg, this goes back to something I shared actually at our first meeting a couple weeks ago, this notion of how we are thinking about our role as neighbor in our particular urban place. And, and in particular, picking up on that theme, our founding scriptural um, kind of uh, phrase from John 1.14 on and the word became flesh. And, and to see how that is both embedded in our history. That was the founding scripture on the logo for Augsburg Seminary. And it now, of course, is embedded um, actually on the wall in the new Hagford Center. So carrying over that deep commitment to what it means to be the word made flesh, both as a theological and a practical claim kind of into our life in service to our neighbors in a whole variety of ways. And then finally, Semper Reformanda. I would often uh, argue uh, that this may be the greatest gift uh, for a college or university president uh, at this moment, because the challenges of the time um, in terms of just the higher education landscape, what's going on in the rest of the world, really requires that our universities and colleges are constantly thinking about how, how do we teach better? How do, how do we teach more effectively? How do we uh, shape our life? How do we organize ourselves to make sure that we are using the resources that we have in the most faithful mission? based ways. And so constant thinking about uh, what I call the fluidi fluidity of boundaries between the campus and the rest of the world. And so if you were to come to our campus today, you would find outside organizations that have become part of Augsburg because they share our commitment to some aspect of our work. And we actually can do more together because we've been open to new ways of organizing how we do our work as a university. Um, you know, one of the examples I'm most proud of is actually uh, the alliance that we formed um, now probably almost a decade ago with Luther Seminary. Um, and at this point, we are in what we call a strategic alliance. And I was just proud to be able to uh, forge this alliance with my colleague, uh, Robin Steinke, the president of the seminary. And uh, what it means is that we are actually sharing staff, um, sharing resource, technological resources, uh, supporting each other in a variety of ways. And it's just uh, uh, is a wonderful example of how two institutions can, can do something uh, more together than they could do on their own. Um, and so this work continues to unfold. And it's just one example of the many ways in which we're, uh, you know, attempting to really be mindful of how we are constantly involved in thinking about how we can be more faithful uh, and live our lives and organize our lives in ways that make, uh, you know, a better use of our resources. Then I'm going to end here uh, before we open it up um, by just pointing to the fact that the kinds of ways that I've just laid out, how we've translated this to Augsburg's uh, commitment to the Lutheran uh, tradition, uh, has actually now also been lifted up uh, at the ELCA uh, into the creation here about uh, four or five years ago of something called the Network of ELCA Colleges and Universities. Uh, we've, we are all have been, the 26 of us have been, you know, certainly linked to the ELCA over the years, but we, and we had some staff support, uh, but in fact, it was all, never clear exactly what uh, we, what role we played within the ELCA. Uh, they're, they're proud of us. Uh, you know, most of the you know, folks that work, you know, or, or at least over time have worked at the ELCA and a lot of the pastors and, you know, bishops are graduates of our schools, but what, 
does it mean to be a, a college or university of the ELCA? And so we came together as presidents uh, and we actually formed a formal network. Um, and through our own resources and some from the ELCA, we've actually now formed this network and have staff for this network. Um, and one of the things we did after forming the formal network was to actually uh, call on a group of faculty from our schools to create a statement, um, which uh, is actually available if you're interested in it on the ELCA website. That statement is called Rooted and Open. Um, rooted and Open. Um, I go back to how I actually labeled this presentation as faithful and relevant. I would say it's perhaps the same, uh, the same kind of dynamic that we've created, Rooted and Open, but what they call the common calling of our network of e ELCA colleges and universities. And, and it's so interesting for me now, again, this is my 16th year as Oxford president, so I'm, I'm actually, uh, at the end of this year, I'll become the dean of the uh, ELCA college presidents. And, and to watch this unfold over these 16 years and to understand how, uh, you know, what at, along the way, perhaps uh, the diminishment of the Lutheran kind of presence, if you will, in some of these colleges and universities, and how they've all come to the table and said, no, this Lutheran faith tradition is critical to who we are. It, it is what has made us who we are. It makes us distinctive. It makes us that third way that uh, Daryl Jada points to. And what ties us together is the notion that we believe that our education calls and empowers students to serve the neighbor so that all may flourish. That's the, the three phrases, and each of those phrases is then kind of explicated in the document. But it's a powerful statement that really binds us together as a network. And I would just uh, say to you that um, uh, the real joy for me uh, to have watched now as new presidents join us, how they come in and, and fully embrace this notion and, and how we're in many ways we're bringing um, this Lutheran uh, faith tradition back to life, if you will, in ways that are, I believe are both faithful to that tradition and to its core principles, core theological pr principles, as well as uh, its core values and commitments uh, in the 21st century uh, in, res in response to a very different context, very different uh, uh, student bodies uh, and, and very different needs in the world, I would say. So um, if you are interested well, more- I want to interrupt here very quickly, just to correct one thing. Uh, President Privenau has not only watch this. He has really created this in many, not alone, but with his leadership. In 2013-14, I was the interim president of Luther College, so I sat in with the college presidents, and you could feel this, both uh, attraction and aversion. Many of them were very worried about their Lutheran identity, whether that was going to be viable going forward and so forth. And to create this uh, occasion, the National Church has lost a lot of its capacity to be the convener and the, many of the college presidents who understood the strength of this really wanted it to be perpetuated. You mentioned the work of Daryl Jalrock. That was a big help to this. But Paul Pribonow was the one who convened and kept this conversation going and hosted meetings of these colleges annually at the summer at Augsburg University. It's really something. So the blessing of this across all of Lutheran higher education, and these schools are very different from each other, is really quite remarkable. And uh, so that also puts a different context on this quest for our saga. Uh, very important. Yeah. Well, I've stopped uh, sharing my screen at this point and uh, you know, want to certainly uh, open it up here. And I, I, I want to thank David again for joining me. He, he is not a formal part of the, of the saga group, but he's been very generous in his time and helping us to uh, really do a deep dive into some of these important questions. So, so thanks, David. And uh, and uh, Jack, we'll turn it back to you to see if... Um... Well, thank you so much, both David and Paul, for your stimulating uh, presentations. And um, a couple of questions are coming. Um, one was wondering about the impact of Americanization of the immigrant church and college for good and ill from earliest days, including a relationship with mainstream and evangelical church traditions. How do you see our third way, perhaps, um, addressing this Americanization? That's an important question. And I do think that there are, um, uh, there are moments in this history where, in fact, you know, the, um, the kind of impact of an Americanization on uh, on the challenges the church was feeling. So even what was happening in uh, Cedar Riverside uh, neighborhood, you know, back in the 19 teens and 1920s that led uh, the church body to think, you know, we, we've got to, we're frightened of this. We're going to get away from this. Um, you know, and certainly the church, um, 
you know, as a as a body, we I think it's part of our critical inquiry. Understand that there are places where, um, in fact, they weren't as sensitive to some of the um, you know the social issues and the challenges that were going on. And the, you know, uh, it's interesting you look at uh, what happened in the late 1960s and Augsburg's response to the kind of civil rights movement. Um, uh, you know, it. Um, uh, if some of you may be on this call actually were there for one day in May when Oscar Anderson actually uh, called classes off and brought in all of these uh, speakers from uh, uh, across the Twin Cities to really challenge uh, Augsburg to um, to think about um, you know what it meant to be a college embedded in the heart of a city and to have um, you know people of different races in particular African Americans and you know fighting for their own rights uh, and where what did the college uh, what was its its role in that um, we have these wonderful uh, audio tapes in our archives now of students challenging Oscar Anderson and uh, Joel Torrisonson and Carl Krislock to, you know, to think deeply about these questions. Um, and the truth is, um, as part of our critical inquiry, um, uh, you know, it's not to criticize them, they didn't know how to respond, to be quite honest. I mean, you can sort of hear it in the ways that they respond in these, in the, some of the sessions that they, uh, they, they tended to do what I think a lot of college universities did. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it, uh, they they said, well, "Well, we need to study this more." <laughs> That's not what the students wanted. They didn't want to study this more. They wanted them to do something about it. Now that led Joel to do something like the Crisis Colony. Many of you know in the early '70s when Joel set up the Crisis Colony on uh, the north side of Minneapolis. And uh, over the years, that tradition has taken shape in ways that I think are, um, you know, certainly a response, uh, a real leaning into those issues. And and here we are today. Um, and I have alums from the 1950s and 60s who come to me and say, this is what we always hoped Augsburg would become because of its place in the city. We wanted you to be this place that had this diverse student body. We wanted you to be a place that had a kind of commitment to neighbor in this kind of deep and ongoing way. We wanted you to be a place that actually thinks about how to be anti-racist, you know, in terms of how it, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we've inherited that sometimes serve as obstacles to our student success. So all of that now is built in to how we are, um, you know, thinking about the work uh, of, uh, of the university. So um, I don't know, David, you might know more about some of the broader, you know, ecclesiological trends and things there, but um, but certainly I'm not sure that um, Augsburg always knew as a university how to deal with, um, you know, with what was going on in the country over those various eras. So. I think the uh, word Americanization has a lot in it, and I don't know quite what is in the mind of the person who's asking the question, but it is true this whole 150 plus years is a discussion of immigrant groups coming to terms with this new world. And then as the world changes, uh, certainly the replication of European Christendom and, uh, is not what the future holds. <laughs> so the question is very much in play. A wonderful question. And we could write about 10 books about this. And as I mentioned, we're now at a time in which we're also struggling with the future denominations. And... Uh, and the whole question of how, how we will be Lutheran, we're really focusing not primarily upon these certain central convictions that guide the educational work itself, open it up huh, with a confidence of the gospel itself. And uh, so this is a different way of, of playing it forward. It is not a uh, sectarian move. But that means it's open to criticism of all kinds, too. Because uh, who knows how to do it right? This is a work in progress. I'm so grateful, though, that it is set in that sort of a set of frame that we're kind of holding ourselves responsible for sustaining this legacy into a very differentiated future. Mm. Very good. Uh, the same person, it's uh, the good Reverend Dr. Mark Center is one is one giving us these questions today. Um, he writes about Bonhoeffer saying Bonhoeffer wrote that Christ was at the center and and who is Christ for us today? And he's asking the question, how does it work in an interfaith capacity where we claim faith Christ to be the center, the baptism as our primary vocational factor uh, and then the ongoing understanding of Augsburg history uh, how does this work its way out in this um, diverse setting that we find ourselves? How do we hold Christ at the center um, and do it in a manner in which we do not lose the core of our faith as we um, reach out 
uh, in interfaith diversity? I want to pick into that quickly. First of all, that question needs to be kept alive. And what I'm going to say now is not to answer the question, but just to investigate it just a little bit more. That question is just fabulous. But when we were working on the Christensen lessons, we got help from two places that were kind of interesting. There is a guy named Roland Miller, who was an Islamic scholar at uh, Luther Seminary, and he had written some very things about faith and friendship. And he himself had learned as a missionary in India, he said, I cannot sh share my love for Jesus Christ until I learn my, number, my neighbor's love for the Quran. Because I have to respect that deep, deep faith that he has or she has and then we both risk the, the possibility of being converted. That He said, if you don't do that, you're not really doing this. That was fascinating. So that interfaith friendship piece comes from the rhetoric of Roland Miller. And then we went to the love of God draws us, the uh, love of Christ draws us to God. And that was the very depth of that kind of th statement that uh, Bonhoeffer was, to which Bonhoeffer was speaking as well. That uh, that is not a confining statement, but it is an opening statement. But there's a lot to be said about that. And how should you then play that script in the world of higher education with the diffusion and post-Christendom post world into which we're moving? Uh, how will we be Christian himself? Bonhoeffer asked that kind of a question very deeply. A very concrete example of um, how we hold this creative tension um, at the beginning of at every uh, procession into our um, our commencement uh, ahead of all the international flags and everything we carry the cross um, and I occasionally will get a question from a student uh, perhaps from a different faith tradition you know uh, why should I walk behind that cross and I say you are graduating from an institution that was made possible because of that cross. Um, and that is our commitment to you, is that because of the education you've received here, it, it has been shaped by our belief that, in fact, uh, you know, Christ uh, died on that cross for for all of uh, creation. And and that's actually made it possible for us to be the kind of university that we are today. And, and you just think about that. I mean, um, uh, the, the, as I mentioned, the two required religion courses, I mean, it's a, it's a place where we teach students the Lutheran theological concept of vocation. They, they learn it through Martin Luther, they learn it through the scriptures, uh, they, they learn the ways in which that that particular deal, and, and our good friend uh, Mark Tranvik, who uh, is an emeritus professor at Augsburg now at the seminary, was relentless in reminding us that this is the theological concept of vocation that is at the foundation. It's the pillar. Uh, it's the footing, if you will, uh, you know, that in fact we need to teach students those aspects of that concept so that they understand where it comes from. Um, you know, and then again, how it gets played out in their own lives. Um, uh, I would just say, go back to what I said earlier, uh, for the kind of meaningful way in, in which it, it, uh, it, it is a gift that we are able to give away um, and ultimately to be open to wherever that leads students uh, in their own lives. So. It's also true that several faculty are crafting their sense of this engagement with deep roots into Dietrich Bonhoeffer's work in the Third Reich, because this is not something that is just culturally dominant. It is actually now a countercultural conviction. And so Bonhoeffer's readiness to be a discipleship that means to come and die is really brought into that discussion deeply. Yeah. Well, thank you both for your presentation and, um, and for your um, responses to <laughs> these questions that are not easy um, to come by. What is the, um, the impact geographically of the Free Church? How far did it go? Was it the Dakotas and Minnesota? Did the Free Church have impact in Iowa as they be, uh, came up against the, the German Lutheran understanding of the church? Or where... where what what was the uh, extent geographically of that of of the Haugian influence? Well, uh, you know, it it was more far flung. I don't know about Iowa, but it, uh, we know that there were you know uh, Lutheran free churches in Washington State, and you know, so so up maybe you know going out in that direction uh, where where the Norwegians were still you know strong and. 
where they could fight off Concordia <laughs> where they needed to. But, you know, you think about the Strauman legacy. I mean, there's these uh, amazing stories that Mert Strauman you know, tells us about uh, before he died about, um, you know, how when he and his brothers, uh, Claire and Luther, were kids and their dad was a pastor out there at one of the Lutheran Free Churches, how, uh, you know, Augsburg would put out an appeal because they were about to go bankrupt and the dad would go down to the bank and take out all their savings and send it to Augsburg to help keep it alive. So, so that you know, it did spread out uh, certainly to, you know, other geographic areas. Um, you know, it had a mission component as well. So it was yeah. important to it. And so, um, you know, it's, uh, it was a, it, it's fascinating because we, of course, we have access to all those records. If you read, uh, uh, read Chris Lock, I mean, he, <laughs> he recounts a lot of it, you know, in more detail than perhaps you need to have in, uh, you know, and from Ford to Freeway, which is his hundred year anniversary. And, and actually, as we've gone back into some of this into our archives, I mean, just the meticulous records they kept of all of their meetings and the transcripts of those conversations and the things they fought over. And <laughs> it was, it's quite a, it's quite a, uh, quite a narrative. So. Um, That's a great question. I think one of the things we have to think about is that most of the Lutherans, in the Midwest immigrated in the 19th century. Uh, and so that included at the same time of other pietistic movements, the uh, Leia movement out of uh, Neuen Dettelsau and the Kuiper movement out of uh, Holland and the Covenant coming from Sweden. So there was more commonality there of a anti-state church mentality across these spectrums than was the case of Eastern Lutheranism. And we felt that some of that strain right up to the time of the ELCA was happening about how we understood the authority of bishops and so forth. Very interesting. But in that time, yeah, there was a lot of contention between them. And, uh, you know, they, they, you could always find a reason for a church fight. But what they were struggling about was a living faith in this new land. And it was, and meanwhile, with a very interesting global reach, the Free Church had very strong presence in Madagascar and in China. <laughs> so that also had impact coming back to Augsburg. Huh. Well, thank you. Thank you both for your presentations today. We're going to um, remind our listeners and participants that next week is our fourth and final session. Um, and the theme is accompanying our neighbors. We believe we are called. We have the privilege of having a professor of nursing, Katie Clark, to be with us, and a doctoral student, um, Muna Adarachman, um, who both have very interesting uh, bios. And I would encourage you to, before next week, to go online at augsburg.edu slash centered life and um, read their bios, the extent to which they're involved in the community beyond um, their direct involvement at Augsburg University. So this final session, we'll try to pull out the various threads of the previous sessions together to describe Augsburg's distinctive commitments to being neighbor. Um, and this would be particularly around the Augsburg Health Commons at Central Lutheran Church in the Cedar Riverside area. Um, we'll also have Paul, uh, Dr. Primanow, and uh, I will talk about the implications now of this four-part series on our own individual lives and the institutions in which we as participants uh, have influence. So with that, Thank you so much for attending, and we look forward to next week, same time, same station, uh, for our fourth and final presentation in this series. Have a great weekend. Thanks, David. Yep.